Well, it's lovely to see you, Julia, and it's great to see you in action um, after seeing you, um, you both on DVD and also um, hearing your recent record of, of Russian concertos. That was a really interesting choice. Um, it was the first recording you made for Pentatone. I'm fascinated to know why you chose that particular repertoire, because it's, it's quite mm -hmm. unusual. It's not the standard Russian stuff. Yes, of course, uh, but actually I didn't really chose it. I mean, uh, we, um, I met Jakob Kreuzberg last year in mm -hmm. Philadelphia, and we played the Khatatoyan violin concerto there. And um, actually after the dress rehearsal, uh, I mean, it was clear from the beginning that we got along very, very well. And um, after the dress rehearsal, he asked me, you know, would you like to record it with me? And I was like, why not? Why not? <laughs> why not? But I actually didn't take it too seriously. And um, I thought that, yeah, this is just a normal, polite sentence yes, <laughs> the yeah. conductor says at the rehearsal. But he called me two days later asking, what are you doing in May? And, and he said, well, I'm pretty busy, but the two days I'm free. And mm -hmm. I said, OK, good to know. Then he called me a week later and said, well, we do have a week in Moscow to record, so um, are you in? <laughs> Excellent. And that's how it more or less happened. Of course, yes. there were then things to be solved and so on. but. That's how the Khachaturian came mm -hmm. on board. And then we, of course, thought about uh, what else shall we put on the record. And um, it was Yakov's idea, I believe, together with people from Pentatone, to make a Russian violin concerto CD. Um, and I didn't want to put Tchaikovsky on it, because I didn't want to have Tchaikovsky as my debut album. So um, we thought about other possibilities. And I always loved Coffee of Number One. It mm -hmm. was one of my favorite pieces. So um, we put that on the on the record too and and then I figured out that it's actually not too long those two contrary because the Prokofiev is so That's short. Right, yes. And then I just thought okay let's put Lazarov on it and actually we didn't know if it's gonna fit because it was so long mm -hmm. and we said okay let, let's record it and if it's fit if it fits then fine if not then we put it for the next city. Yeah. And um, then they actually managed exactly to put it on the city so that's how the three contrary yes. came on one. One of the things that struck me hearing you just now in your new recording of Bach is that you seem to be so certain about where you're going with the music. There's no, there's no hesitation, there's almost no experimentation. I just get this feeling that you know exactly what you want. It's in your head and you're just producing it. Is that true? <laughs> nice impression of me. Um, actually, um, depends on the piece. I mean, the Bach uh, sonatas and partitas I've learned between I was nine and, and 14, mm -hmm. so I learned actually each year one sonata or partita. And of course I've played them very long and I've always, actually I always practice Bach. There is not a day in my mm -hmm. life without Bach. And as we only have more or less those six sonatas and partitas plus the two concerti, mm -hmm. so the six sonatas for harpsichord and violin, um, I play those sonatas and partitas every day. And um, so, I always wanted to record them. That was always, you know, when someone asked me, what, what would you like to record first? I always mm -hmm. said, Bach. It was, it was always clear to me because I spent so much time with it. And um, I am a huge Glenn Gould fan. Mm -hmm. Very, very huge. Actually, me pretty, too. Yes. actually pretty crazy, <laughs> I must say. And um, so I remember when I, I saw a videotape of him playing Bach, uh, D minor concerto yes. yeah. uh, with Bernstein conducting. Yeah. And I saw that when I was 12. And I had almost a nervous breakdown because I figured out that he was dead, so I cannot marry him. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you'd have wanted to marry him anyway. Very strange guy. Yes, I know that he was a very strange guy, but to that time for me, he was just a genius yes. and my hero.
So there was really no chance you were ever going to do anything else. <laughs> well, actually, you know, the, the only thing I'm, I sometimes maybe regret a little bit is that I never made it, had it possible to make a choice if I want to become a violinist or a pianist. Right. And if I, I don't know what I would have chosen if I would have had to make this choice. I don't know. Because I always enjoyed playing piano so much, I mean, mm. to this day. And um, I still play piano, and I play pl piano with orchestra, and I, I experienced all these things. And I'm not sure if I would have, if, if I would have become a violinist or a pianist, I don't know. So, so what was it that pushed you towards being a violinist rather than a pianist? Uh, the only the fact that my first uh, invitation was on the violin right. with orchestra because someone heard me in a master class where I played piano, not vi uh, where I played violin and not piano. That's why I became a violinist. That's the only reason. I think the fact that you grew up in obviously a very potent musical environment helped to shape the person you are today. Did that help or would you have become a violinist anyway? Probably yes, but I mean I never questioned it. It was always clear to me that I'd become a musician. But of course it was also because I saw a musician at home. I saw what the life is and I saw um, how happy one can be with music mm -hmm. and music was always part of our, our life. Thank you. 